great to be here. Thank you all. You can see my slides. You can see my face. Uh, I think we're in good shape here. Uh, as I said, I'm informal today because uh, Kate asked us to wear the dedicated T-shirt. Uh, so this first slide there shows me and the T-shirt from last year's dedicated conference. And so today we're going to be talking about machine learning and AI at the edge, insights as a service. Uh, and I added some extra words there uh, to the uh, listed title. And those extra words say delivering insights as a service with an observability strategy. So for me, for the last year, I've been noticing a lot of discussion. Uh, it certainly uh, grew out of sort of the, the IT and the cybersecurity world around the word observability. So observability uh, has a lot to do with observing what's going on in your systems and keeping track of everything's performance, uh, whether there's data breaches or not, or whether it's performing normally. And so as I thought about observability, there's a lot of conversation around uh, IT monitoring for many years. And it occurred to me that monitoring is what you do, uh, but observability is why you do it. And so basically it's a strategy. And so observability strategy is what I'm gonna talk about today. And how do we go about getting insights and specifically insights as a service? So I wanna start with a story. I always like to stay a storytelling. And, uh, and when I was uh, applying to uh, speak to this conference, uh, so Kate had an online uh, speaker uh, request form if you wanted to apply to speak at this conference. Uh, so if you ever do that in the future, I hope uh, some of you will do that. Anyway, so I, I had a, I was torn between what session I wanted to be in because I'm a big fan of data storytelling and data literacy. Uh, but anyway, it ended up in this in this sort of trends AI and machine learning trends session because I really feel this is an interesting trend right now. But I always start with a story. And the story begins with this little quote from a famous baseball philosopher. Some of you probably know Yogi Berra. He said all kinds of funny things. Uh, for example, you can see a lot by just looking. And so the story goes, actually, it's, it's, an, it's about a, uh, a uh, Le Mans uh, race, a, a Formula One race in Europe in the 1950s. Okay, so the story doesn't really have anything to do with data analytics, but you'll see in a minute what it has to do about insights, insights discovery. And so the story goes, and this this picture that I just want to mention, the, the picture in the in in the slide here is not from the 1950s. It's from a recent Formula One race. Uh, just a little bit of eye candy in the slide here, but the race goes way back to the 1950s. And so it has to do with this being able to see a lot by just looking, or like this, what I like to say is being able to see around corners. So insights out as a service is about getting insights about something that's happening in your environment to allow you to see something before it happens, see something before you are able to see it otherwise uh, through direct observation, therefore see around corners. And that's what insights are for me. It's like you, you have an understanding, you have, you, have, you have this sort of early warning bells going off in your head, well, not in your head in this case, in your data, that tells you something uh, bad is about to happen or something interesting is about to happen to be prepared. So the story goes, this, 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 this race driver uh, was driving this race and then uh, many, many drivers anyway. So there was, there was a long straightaway. So if you're familiar with Formula One racing, it goes through city streets, big cities. And so there's very long stretches where they have uh, straight roads and, and crowds are alongside the road cheering for the drivers as they race by. And then they come to the end of that street, that road, and they have to make a sharp turn down some other street. So the cars go extremely fast, and then they they had to slow down dramatically in order to turn the corner, to turn that sharp turn in, the, in that city's uh, streets to, to race down another street. So it's not like a, norm, a normal oval race where you can sort of keep a, a sort of steady speed around the oval. There's really fast portions and really slow portions in these kinds of races. <clears throat> and so what happened in this particular race is they went down this uh, very uh, long straightaway with all the crowds cheering. And as the race car drivers turned the corner, there was a crash. So no one could see the trash because they were going down the straightaway. They couldn't see around the corner. So that they would, uh, the next car would come around that, that corner and crash because they couldn't see that they couldn't stop in time uh, to avoid the crash. And so there was a sequence of crashes uh, and pileups that, that happened right around that corner. Of course, no one could see it until they got around the corner. Then it was too late. But there was one driver who went down that straightaway really fast, like everyone else. And then when he got to that corner, he, he took the corner more wide. He, 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 instead of taking a sharp turn, he took a wide turn, a more a cautious turn around the corner. He avoided the crash, and ultimately he won the race. And at the end of the, at the, end of the race, there was all this uh, uh, press around hanging around him. And I, I'm not, not exactly sure how this worked, but I would imagine it was something like this. They were praising him for his skill as a driver and how fantastic he, is, he was at avoiding the crash in order to win the race. 
And as they were praising him for his skills, he was just shaking his head saying, no, 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 that's not what happened. That's not what happened. And they said, well, what do you mean that's not what happened? And he said, I just knew something was wrong. I just knew something was not right. I didn't, I didn't know, but it, in hindsight, and now he said, in hindsight, I now understand what happened. I understand why I did what I did. And that is when I was driving down that straightaway going really fast, normally the crowd is watching the driver go by, but the crowd was looking down the street. They were looking, not looking at me. He said, normally people will turn their heads real fast as the cars race by. People turn their head real fast. That's what you do in a race like that. The crowd is waiting for that moment when the car comes racing by full speed. And he said, but their heads were all turned looking elsewhere. They weren't looking at me. And I, and I didn't realize it at the time, but in hindsight, I realized that it, my intuition told me something was not right because all the heads were looking in that direction. And so basically, he got uh, feedback. He got data from the sensors in his environment, which, are the, which is the crowd. And those sensors could see from where their, their vantage point in the stands on the side of the street. They could see around that corner and see there was a crash. And that's what they were looking at. So th those sensors were detecting something that the driver himself could not see. From the vantage point of his car, a low car, very low to the ground, uh, in the middle of the street, could not see around the corner, but the sensors at a higher vantage point could see. So actually, th in taking into account all this extra sensor information, intuitively, he was able to avoid the crash and win the race. But the message is, is that if we, if we use our other data sensors, and not just the ones that are right in front of our face, but others that are in our environment, we're able to get sort of cognitive and contextual insights, even predictive insights to things that are about to happen. In other words, being able to see around the corner. And so, yeah, we can see a lot by just looking. And that means not, not just looking at what's right in front of us, but what are the other sensors telling us? And a very good example of this is self-driving cars. If all you have is one single camera at the front of your self-driving car looking straight down the street, deciding what you should, how the car should drive, what, what the car should be doing, you really miss all the context on the side of the road. But there might be children playing on the side of the road. There might be a ball game and the ball might roll into the street. You have to be prepared for something that might happen when you see these things happening in the environment around you. So being cognitive and contextual like that gives you insights and how better to respond than just having the one single sensor. So how do we accomplish this in our world is we have sensors now on everything. We're basically putting sensors on everything. And I like to say people, the internet of things is, is just basically saying, well, the internet used to be a thing. Now things are the internet. So what all those things give you is context. What all those sensors give you is that contextual data, those early warning signs, those early warning signals that, that, that either tell you that some, everything is happening normal, there's, no, there's abnor no abnormality in their environment, whether it's your business or your customers or an airplane or a machine shop or your car engine or an online shopping uh, platform, whatever. The, if the sensors are saying everything is just moving along normally uh, from all the context, context in the world, context in the economy, context in events or in, in the world, whatever, uh, then, then you could keep moving along smoothly. But if you get some kind of disruption in those normal flows of data, those normal signals, those normal patterns in the data, if there's some kind of new emerging pattern, then that may, might be the early warning sign like that uh, race car driver picked up. So now context is basically everywhere, okay? We now have access to context from all these sensors everywhere. So, so from the internet of things, I now like to just call that the internet of context because context is essentially everywhere. <coughs> So Internet of Things is more than just monitoring. Like I said earlier, we talk, people talked a lot about monitoring for many years, Mo monitoring systems, monitoring services, monitoring platforms, monitoring devices, monitoring uh, e your e-commerce or your network logs, all kind of things. But observability is a strategy. Okay, so you want to do more than just monitor. You want to do more than just collect data. So I'm, I'm going to read through the words here because there's a lot of words on this slide, and I put them there intentionally because they actually convey my message. So excuse me while I read the words. I hate reading words on slides, but this, this is really part of my message here. That deploying sensors everywhere guarantees a data deluge. Ouch. We don't need more data necessarily. In fact, in the next line, it says we don't really need more information. What we need is more insights. That's the truth. What we need is more insights, not just more data and more bits. So consequently, our I IoT deployments need to be smart. That is, if we're going to put sensors in everything and start c collecting deluges and, and massive floods of data, then we better be smart about it. So what do we mean by being smart? Well, first of all, we're talking about being cognitive, contextual, and even predictive, as I just mentioned. And it's really cool that Mike Wimmerle is just talking about cognitive robots and, and cognitive AI, because that's really where we're moving. We're moving towards this sort of cognitive world 
where we don't just have data streams coming from an S from, from a single source. We, we, we have all that contextual information that help us navigate our world safely, just as that race car driver navigated that turn safely. So smart not, is not just cognitive and contextual, but it's also smart in the sense that it uh, takes deliberate decisions and in, in, in corporations and organizations on where and when we place sensors, where and when and how we collect data in order to get those insights. And so they need to be strategic decisions, strategic placement, strategic data collection in organizations. And therefore, strategic focuses on the missions and outcomes. Consequently, are, we're, we're talking about a strategy now. So, so observability strategy is how you get to, ha to having more insights and not just more information. So if we want insights as a service from our sensors everywhere, it has to be strategic, it has to meet mission objectives, not just floods of data being poured into a cloud or poured, poured into a data center. Then what do we do with all this stuff? Okay, so again, monitoring is what you do. Sensors are how you do it, but observability is why you do it. And the insights you gain from these data are, the re are your rewards for doing it. The insights are your rewards. That's really what it's about. Now, if you can apply, if you can give, put APIs on these sensors, so now anyone can basically subscribe to sensor data or even subscribe to patterns in data, which is, more, which is even smarter. Put an, put an AI, put a machine learning app at the sensor. And there are now processors that go on sensors that can actually do deep learning and AI at the point of data collection. And so people can actually subscribe through an API to the insights from a sensor. So you really do have insights as a service. And it can, you can imagine that you can even have a business model here where you could sell those insights. You can sell those API accesses, so subscriptions uh, to other organizations and to other uh, people. So insights as a service uh, as part of your observability strategy. So the three things you can do with this insights as a service, I just list sort of three things here quickly and then I'm going to wrap up. <coughs> Excuse me. First, cognitive analytics, like I just said. So, so cognitive is really about that. What, what, why is this weird thing happening? Why is this funny thing happening in my data? Why is this, uh, this, why is the crowd looking down the street and not looking at me? That sort of thing. Fine. So cognitive analytics for me, I define that as discovering the right questions you should be asking your data. So it's not like descriptive analytics. Descriptive analytics is the opposite. Descriptive is said, here are the questions. So, uh, so a typical business analyst is given these, here's your questions. Here's the questions I want you to answer. Cognitive analytics is, hey, what are the questions I should be asking? There's something funny on my data, a funny trend, a funny pattern, something that's not normal. So cognitive analytics is one, is one thing you can do with insights as a service. Another thing is this precursor analytics. So it's not exactly predictive analytics. It's about seeing around corners. So you, you don't know exactly when or what or how it's going to happen, but you know something's going to happen. So it's not exactly predictive analytics, which is very specific, that like this customer will click on that or this disease uh, this particular uh, pattern in, in uh, medical data is, uh, is diagnosed with this particular disease. So predictive analytics is more about getting the specific classification right. Precursor analytics is about seeing those early warning signs. And I like to call that forecasting as a service. Okay, so I actually talk about pre precursor analytics and a little uh, ad, uh, self ad here. Uh, I have an online course uh, that you can find. And if you if you want to click through there, uh, the, the slides for this particular talk are at the uh, listed there, and I'll show, show you that, that link again at the, on the next slide. Get these slides, and you can click on the links that you see in the slide here, and where I talk about precursor analytics and forecasting as a service. And the third thing you do is set what I call sentinel analytics. Okay, a sentinel is the guard on the guard post, uh, 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 keeping people alerted in, 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 the, uh, in the barracks at night. Everything is clear or, or the enemy is coming, right? And so, there's the, so, the, so the sentinel is there also to, to, to be reassuring that everything is fine, there, there's no problem, or if there is a problem, everybody wake up and address it. Okay, so sentinel analytics is, is, can be just basically giving you reassurance for compliance sake and for comfort sake that things are working well. And I like to call it like, like picking up the good vibrations. That is, your data is just humming along. There's no weird anomalies. There's, there's no hiccups. There's no strange patterns emerging. Everything is just humming the good vibrations from your data. So Sentinel Analytics is, is, is sort of watching and making sure that things are working. But if you don't have a Sentinel there, how do you know, right? So observability, putting sensors on, on things that you need to keep an eye on is very significant, even when there is nothing bad happening, uh, like the precursor analytics might be an early warning of something. Sentinel Analytics could be both that and at the same time that reassurance, the good vibrations.
And so finally, I just want to say thanks for listening. Uh, we are hiring data professionals at Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, we, we have tons of openings. We're, we're looking for people, data scientists, data engineers, cloud engineers, AI and machine learning developers. Uh, follow the links here. I uh, hope you can join us. Uh, thanks for listening today. I talked pretty fast in order to, to meet my time limit. I don't know if I met my time limit or not, Kate, but th but thanks for, for not uh, cutting me off there. And thank you all. Yes, for I was just about to jump in, but you wrapped up, Kirk. So thank ah! you so much. You still have we'll some for questions. Well, so you did great. We can take at least two, three questions, which I love. That was formula. Um, that was Formula One speaking real fast, and then sudden. Yes, stop. <laughs> zooming past. Yes, you have a lot of comments and questions that flew in here. Jeanette says she, you know, loves the presentation. Uh, Captain Kirk, what a great way to see insights. Alberto loves your F1 um, analogy. Data, data is everywhere, and we did have several questions come in. I'm just going to go ahead and scroll to one. Um, there's an interesting one here from Katina. She says, how do you add sensors to a non-physical idea like a process? How can observability help you in processes? Well, it depends upon what you mean by process. You mean if it's a human process, uh, then, then sometimes there's paper documents, right? I mean, there's, there's emails. There's, there's, so, so, there's, so there's some kind of digital trail of the process. And so, so the process normally, I mean, just say, for example, a simple uh, claims uh application uh processing if, if something is getting hung up in the process it usually would take you like you know maybe a day or half a day for, for to go from step a to step b but if something is sitting and not moving for many many days uh, that's an early warning sign that something is wrong with that in the process or with that particular claim and so assuming that there's digital trails of some kind and it's in processes uh hopefully we have a lot of those uh, then you can look for sort of patterns, uh, for example, the, the, the frequency at which things are happening, if that frequency changes, for example. I mean, we, we can give whole talks on process mining, yeah. which I don't have time for today, but that, that's one way to do it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, a question here from Robert. Can this technology be used to detect early heart attacks? Well, yes, I think so. I think uh, people who have Fitbits and other wearable devices and, and heart sensors, I was just using a little oxygen sensor that my, one of my daughters gave me for Christmas before I sat down. And I said, oh, my, my heart rate is picking up here. Oh, that's because I'm one minute late for, for signing on to StreamYard. So, yes. So, yes. It, so, uh, but but again, yeah. It, 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 so, so what I'm saying here is that the, you can see these changes in, in your health uh, sensors, right, and, and your and your heart, heart condition, your, your heart pulse rate, body mm -hmm. temperature, oxygen sensors. I was what I was wearing this morning. Uh, so it doesn't mean that it's going to predict a heart attack. That, I, leave, I would leave that to the doctor. But if it's an early warning sign that you have a health condition, that will get you to the doctor faster to, to address whatever might be going on for you. So, yeah. so in some sense, yes, it's predictive of that. But it, but most most importantly, I want to say it's a precursor early warning sign of that. So you go get an expert's opinion on what's going on. Yeah, we're definitely getting closer to that. Um, and then lastly, there's a comment here from Kimberly that I truly, truly agree with. Captain Kirk, you never, ever disappoint. <laughs> it's a really liking presentation as always. Thank um, you. Yes, I